Okay. Um, and now back to diagrams. <laughs> so, what is a spoken dialogue system? A spoken consists of three main units. The first is a, a which is understanding of the user input. The second one is the dialogue management unit, which decides what to say back to the user. And the third one is speed generation unit, which produces, uh, which converts uh, the system output into language and speech. Underlying these uh, units is the knowledge with which a dialogue system operates. So when the user speaks, their speech is being recognized by automatic speech recognizer and turned into text. This, based on this text, we extract some dialogue states. And based on these states, the dialogue manager and the policy makes decisions. This is what we call actions. These actions are evaluated by some external or internal metrics and more formally with the reward estimator. Then these actions are passed to natural language generator, which generates text, and finally to speech, to, uh, text to speech synthesizer, which generates speech. Um, now there is one problem with this kind of approach. And that is that once we divide problems into the problem into these modules, um, the, there is some loss of information that happens between these modules. So when we go from text to states to actions to text again, in this pipeline, a lot of information is lost. And in some, in in order to alleviate. Uh, this problem, what we can do is take a probabilistic approach and pass distributions between modules. In that way, the uncertainty that comes from the automatic speech recognizer or or net or beliefs or state tracker it passed down to the decision making unit. And that is how our state tracker becomes belief state tracker. So a belief state is a distribution over potential dialogue states. Now, let me explain what belief state is and what belief tracking is. Say you are building a dialogue system that can uh, recommend restaurants. The user calls and says, I'm looking for a Thai restaurant. Now, this can be recognized as Thai restaurant because Thai and Thai are very acoustically similar, or with Thai restaurant with some smaller probability. Now, the belief state is measuring what is the user intent, what the user wants from this conversation. So we can see that from both of these inputs, the user wants a restaurant, but we are not quite sure what kind of restaurant the user wants. Therefore, the system asks the user question, uh, what kind of food would you like? Now this time, the user simply says Thai, which again can be misrecognized as Thai, or perhaps as Turkish, and only with very small probability as Thai. Now, the key point is here. If you don't do any belief tracking, you completely forget about what happened previously. Therefore, now we are not actually sure that anymore that the user wants a restaurant, and Thai has the least probability. And the, user, the system has no same question again. And this is what is particularly annoying to, to users, repeating the same question all the time. Now, what happens if we do believe tracking? Now, if we do believe tracking at the second turn, we talked about restaurants, and that there was some evidence for Thai food in the first turn. So now, although Thai is the last in this uh, list of potential inputs, 
it actually is the most probable dialogue state. So then the system can say, uh, and it's almost as likely as Turkish, so the system can say, did you say Thai or Turkish? Which is a much better question to ask. We can't hope to build systems that are completely uncertainty free. There is no, no work perfect understanding, even amongst humans. But the key is how we model this uncertainty and how we handle this uncertainty. Now, that was a very simple example, but if you want to deploy deep learning to operate on a very large scale systems that have uh, a large number of these, um, of these belief states, here I only mentioned restaurant food, uh, ta food or um, other restaurant related um, uh, concepts, if you want to build this tracker using deep learning methods, you need enough training data for every kind of concept that you have in your ontology or in your database. And that simply does not scale. Now, the solution to this problem is to reuse knowledge. Humans are extremely good in reusing knowledge. They can sometimes learn just from one single example, whereas deep learning methods need a lot and a lot of examples. So what are the key ingredients to reusing knowledge in this case? So the first one is uh, semantically constrained word vector embeddings. And the second one is architecture that shares parameters. Okay, let me explain what I mean by semantically constrained word vector embeddings. Embedding is a vector represent distributed representation of, of a word. And the idea is that two words that are close uh, in, uh, um, in semantically should be close under some measure in this large vector space. Therefore, we should expect that um, uh, similar words appear together. Now, the problem is how we build these, this uh, vector representation. They are typically relying on context. So they say if uh, uh, cat and dog appear in the same context, they will be close together. Now, the problem is if you train this vector space on dialogue data, things that are very different will appear in almost identical uh, contexts, such as, for instance, I want a luxurious restaurant or I want a cheap restaurant. Luxurious and, and cheap appear in exactly the same context. And this is something that needs to be disentangled. And that is why we introduce semantic constraints to vector embeddings. We use synonyms and antonyms and basically make sure that cheap and expensive are as far as from each other as possible, while upmarket, luxurious and expensive are close together, similarly for center and downtown. Now, why do we need this vector space? We will use this vector space in order to share knowledge between, between different concepts. So we want a belief tracker needs to answer um, four questions. The first question is what, how would the system, um, what basically we have in the ontology, and this is telling us. The second question is how what we uh, have in the ontology relates to the system questions. So for instance, how may I help you? Does this have any reference to any of the concepts that we have in the ontology? Second, uh, sorry, third question is how would, what the user is saying relates to what we have in the ontology? So for instance, I'm looking for an upmarket restaurant. Does that mention um, expensive or not? So basically, we use the embeddings of each concept in the ontology and then compare uh, and then have a feature extractor 
that extracts features that are for domain, for slot, and for value, and comparing that with every single domain that we have, every single slot, and every single value using a similarity metric. Similarly, for the user input, we extract features and again compare this to, um, to the concepts from the ontology. And then final and the crucial question of belief tracker is to actually do belief tracking. So it needs to remember the past. It needs to remember what happened before. And what allows us to remember in deep learning terms? It's a memory cells. It can be an LSTM, it can be a GRU, or, or simple RNN with a, a memory cell. We need to keep track of what happened before. When we have all these things together, we can then do belief tracking. And how does this enable us to do a large-scale belief tracking? Well, simply because here, the, these feature extractors are agnostic to whether we are extracting the slot uh, price range or the slot area. It's simply trained to extract a slot. So we can compare this to different slots and share the parameters. So how does this work in practice? So here we have two data sets. Uh, first, uh, they are both co collected in a Wizard of Oz setting. So one, uh, both, one person was pretending to be the user and the other person was pre pretending to be the system, and they chatted to each other. So the first one is a very small dialog data set, cons consists only of uh, 1,200 chats and has one domain has five domains, and these domains can happen within the same dialogue. The user can ask for a hotel and then a restaurant, and then a, um, a taxi to get to that hotel from the train station, for instance. Um, and it has almost 10,000 dialogues. Now, this data set was collected through a, a Google faculty award that I got. Um, now, let's see the results. So we first looked at the results uh, on the single domain, because for that we had a very good baseline. That's a neural belief track, semantically constrained uh, word vector embeddings. And uh, we can see on the smaller data set uh, that the results are, are much better, but they are plateauing. This is the accuracy, so this is how many times uh, the system gets every single con uh, concept correctly. Now, let's see what happens on this larger data set. Well, here you can see that uh, the knowledge sharing um, model that I just presented also obtains much better results. But here, it's, both of them have in absolute term lower results because uh, this is a much harder uh, dialogue data set to, to work on. Now, if we took the whole data set and not just the restaurants, then we didn't have a very good baseline. But just to give you a taste of how difficult uh, this uh, problem is, if you did uh, just uniform sampling, you would get an average accuracy of 10. Whereas if you use this uh, knowledge sharing um, tracker, you get an average accuracy of 93. OK. And this is probably the key slide of this talk. So you might not understand anything, but it would be nice if you understood this slide. Um, and, and maybe don't look at it, look at me. Um, so if you, if, you are at the, if you are at this point in dialogue, and if the dialogue started here, the belief tracker accumulates all knowledge that happened from the beginning of that dialogue up to that point. It summarizes the past. Now, what, what is the role of a policy optimizer? The policy optimizer it, at this point needs to make a decision. And it's basing that decision on everything that happened so far, but it also needs to be able to predict how the dialogue is going to develop. Is this a good decision or not? 
depends on the future, on how this whole thing is going to evolve. Therefore, belief tracking is summarizing the past, policy optimization is performing the planning and predicting the future. And now a question for you, which machine learning method our framework allows us to perform planning. Any ideas? Yes, reinforcement learning. Okay, so in reinforcement learning, we have our dialogue system or chatbot talking to our user. It is taking some actions and the user is responding. Now, because we can never be sure what user exactly meant, we are going to call what we get from user observations. Based on these observations, the dialogue system is its belief states. And occasionally, it's also getting a reward from the user. And now, the key is to find a policy that is going to maximize this reward over time. And in order to achieve that, we are going to maximize this long-term uh, satisfaction. Now, just a few um, sort of a, a quick 101 in reinforcement learning. One of the key terms of reinforcement learning is return. And what is the return? Now, the return is the, the, the reward that we get from the user, starting from this point in the dialogue where we make the decision until the very end. If we sum all the rewards that we get, this is the return. Now, reward is a, uh, a stochastic value. So we, sometimes we will get for the same situation different rewards depending on the user, depending on the situation. If we take an expectation of that value, we get the, the value function. And with respect to a particular belief state that we are currently in. Now, if we take expectation of the return with respect to a belief state and an action, we get the Q function. Now, in deep reinforcement learning, we optimize value function, Q function, or policy as a neural network. Now, this is a good thing to do because neural networks are nonlinear functions and uh, these, these functions are also nonlinear functions. This is also a bad thing to do because optimization algorithms only give us local optima. Now, probably the most famous deep learning, um, deep reinforcement learning algorithm is DeepQN. And basically, the deep QN, uh, the Q function is approximated as a deep neural network. And the gradient um, is calculated as the difference between our current uh, estimate of Q function, the reward that we get, and our best guess at what the future Q value function will be. Now, the problem with this algorithm is that it gives a biased estimate. And that is because of that max operator there, which is why this, this algorithm is not actually guaranteed to converge. Now, alternatively, we could approximate policy as a neural network, parameterize it, and then the policy gradient theorem gives us an, an analytical expression for gradient. And you can see here that the gradient depends on the return. So the return is really key in all our um, approximations. And this is directly used in reinforce, but also in actocritic methods. <coughs> so what is actocritic framework? Now, in actocritic framework, we have our user, and this is our policy. Now, the dialogue management module, which consists of two parts. One is the actor, and this is what is the policy. So it's it's basically taking some actions. But we also have a critic. And critic takes into account both the belief state and the criticizing the, the actor. 
And based on this critic, the actor can improve. Now, in order to make this work, um, there is one problem. Reinforcement learning algorithms typically require huge amounts of interaction just for problems with very small state spaces. And if you want to apply to something like dialogue, you're confronted with a huge state space, even for something as simple as a dialogue that can offer different restaurants. So then what we do, we take our belief state vector, which is a distribution over concepts, and pass it to the learned policy. But then what, um, what we choose between, what this policy chooses between, is only a handful of actions. Should they inform? Should they offer further information? And then we decide how to actually form the final action based on some heuristics and what we currently have in the belief state. So for instance, if the choice is inform, we would, the final action would be inform Salatong, Tong, which is a Thai restaurant in the center, and that will be finally presented to the user as Salatong Tong is in the center, it serves Thai food. Now, as I said, the problem is that too many interactions are needed to extend this to work on a much larger action space. And the solution is the use of experience replay. So this is again sharing, repeating the knowledge that you, that, that you learn in a different situation. And we'll see that the ability of, the, uh, of this method to learn over two order of magnitude larger action spaces. Now, can somebody just tell me how much time I have left? Five minutes. Five minutes, okay. <laughs> so I'll just, I won't then go into too many details, but one algorithm that allows us to do this is Acer. It is an actual critic algorithm. It uses experience replay, so I'll just briefly say what experience replay is. The idea is that you've, um, maybe like this. The idea is that you, while you're interacting with your user, you're generating some data. And when you're doing reinforcement learning, you're typically using that data just once. But there is no reason why you should just use it once, because your, that data is there, so you can reuse it again. And Indeed, you can, tr you can visit that trajectory again, but you need to keep in mind that this is at the point when you generated this data. And that can be adjusted with important sampling. Now, um, another point was that deep, Q, uh, deep QN is uh, unstable. So in order to alleviate that, we use retrace algorithm. And now you don't have to understand this, this complicated equation here, but you can just see that we lost that max operator here, which allows us then to really do, uh, do learning in a stable and safe way. Another thing that, you, that we throw in into this big pot of, of various methods to make this tractable is, is TRPO, which ensures that the direction of gradient is really the direction of the steepest descent. And then when you put that all together, you, you modify the network, so you have, you're basically predicting from your belief state both policy and the Q function. And we separated the summary and slots so that, that we reduce the overall number of parameters. And then we have one gradient for the policy and one for the Q function. Okay, how, just, just one minute on, on evaluation. So we used um, the open source toolkit that was uh, developed by my group in Cambridge, uh, which um, allows us to, um, to build uh, statistical dialogue systems 
So here we use the Cambridge information, uh, Cambridge restaurant domain, and the original summary action space had only 15 actions, but the master space had 1,000 actions. And we deployed a simulated user that simulates how the, um, the real user behaves. And here we have the training dialog. So this is how much it takes to, for the system to learn. And this is the success rate. So how, um, what is the percentage of successful dialogues during learning? And as you can see, the, so the, the gray line is the, the green er, gray area is um, Acer running on summary space. So it's learning just between 15 actions. So it's much quicker. And the blue one is learning between 1,000 actions. And you can see that although the order of actions is two times bigger with the blue area, it's not as slower, which means that this algorithm really is able to speed up learning significantly. I'll just use a final um, slide just to point you to, uh, to PyDial, which, um, which really uh, build, uh, where you can find different modules of a dialog system implemented in a statistical way. It also offers a common benchmark. So there are, I think at the moment, six different reinforcement learning algorithms, five of which are deep reinforcement learning algorithms. And we've also published a large goal-oriented dialogue corpus of 10,000 dialogues that I spoke in the first half of my talk. Um, so yes, in conclusions, we can really deploy deep learning to achieve uh, But the key is how we share knowledge and how do we learn between large, how do we scale up uh, these algorithms to, for real-world tasks. And challenges ahead are learnable knowledge bases, long-term interaction, and to go back to my video from, from the beginning, sentiment and emotion awareness. So yes, I am, uh, if any of you want to go back to school, I'm looking to, for uh, postdocs and PhD students, so please get in touch. Thank you. Yeah, I mean, um, user simulator is a great thing to have because it allows you to test your models, to compare different algorithms. It's very cheap and you can run it infinitely. But currently deployed user, user simulators are very narrow. They don't really adequately model user population in any way. And the problem is that they're mostly hand-coded. So we've done some work last year on building um, neural user simulators that are slightly more um, human-like. But that is, is really a difficult point. So a lot of my work actually in the past was oriented towards learning directly from a real user. And uh, many of you might disagree with that because there are, um, these are customers and you don't want to subject them to poor uh, performance and so on, but there are ways to, to limit that. And I think really it's, it's great to bootstrap systems with, with uh, simulated users, but eventually you will have to learn from real users and real data. <coughs> Yes? Uh, in one thing, uh, you had this figure where you mentioned that uh, you get some kind of a reward system from the user. Mm -hmm. Should we go back? This one. No, I think it was somewhere in the beginning. Uh huh, yes. Okay. This, this one. Mm -hmm. 
I cannot imagine how would it work in real world because if somebody wants is looking for a Thai restaurant and you actually the PA actually gives him the correct mm -hmm. restaurant and then he hangs up. He doesn't say thank you. So how, how, do how do you know? Yeah. yeah, it's, I mean, it's a big problem. And this is a huge oversimplification, oversimplification of what, what's actually going on. This is basically taken from relationship where we have the environment and the reward comes from the environment system. We don't care. In my experiments, I explicitly asked the user to provide me feedback but they know that in principle that would happen in real life in 1% of cases that people would actually give you feedback. Now, there are more sophisticated ways you can, you can think of, like if you, going, going back to my vision of, of sentiment awareness and emotion, if you can mention or from words that user is using and how the flow is, is going on, how well this system operates, and then uh, if you have access to to the phone, if you can on on, on a, a other metrics, so did the user really go to this restaurant or not? Did they um, come back to you? Did they call again? There are very many metrics you can use, but one which I always always talk about is uh, there is there was this startup in US and they deployed a reinforcement learning system, and uh, they would get one dollar for every call that's not transferred to, to, a, to a human. So they basically took that dollar to be their reward. And they optimized everything in their system based on this dollar. Now, that worked extremely well for them, but obviously in a research scenario, that wouldn't work at all. So evaluation in general of dialogue systems is a big problem. And its reward is an evaluation metric as well as the optimization criteria. Yeah. Uh, maybe a very naive idea, but this came to my mind right now. If I'm getting stressed and I'm unhappy, I'm starting repeating the same things all over. Yeah. So if the user provides all the time, each time, different data, then it means that the conversation goes further. Yeah. If it go goes back all the time, the same data. Yeah. So that that can uh, I I don't know whether that was. Um, yes, yeah, so that um, that goes uh, into the realms of uh, curiosity and measuring curi uh, so using curiosity as as a reward. So, which means basically, did I get new information by asking this? Was I curious, or did I just get the same information? And that would cover this case when the user is simply providing the same information, and the system uh, is. Um, is is not moving and it's not building any additional knowledge. <clears throat> and I had a student last year looking at this, and I think this is a very promising direction, and I certainly want to explore it further. Yes. No, it's fine. Just missed the video. <laughs> Mm -hmm. Does it? Sorry. Does it never regression that it actually overperforms always? How can we assure that the, the new state of the model and the, the new learning contributes yes into a into a better model in the known world, but also doesn't uh, doesn't affect previously uh, unexplored areas which would maybe perform better mm. than the previous model. Yes, so there are several ways you can ensure this. The first and the most important is how you define your reward function. Because the reinforcement learning algorithm is guaranteed. So if everything what is important to you is summarized in this reward function, then you don't have to worry about it. Now, that's usually not the case, because it's, it's very difficult to find a reward function that, that's doing that. For instance, I, I ran into problems where my system was hanging up on the user because the user was asking too difficult question. And they just realized, I just want to, to, because in my reward function, I had a number of turns. So I wanted to minimize the number of turns. But it just took that a step too further. Now, another way to, to ensure this, which is commonly sort of taken by or in, in the in industrial perspective is to say, OK, there are certain things that I don't want my system to do. 
And I know this in advance, and I don't need any algorithm to tell me that it's bad to hang up on the user. So therefore, um, when I decide, when I have these thousand, sec uh, thousand um, so here, when I have thousands of these actions, I don't have actually thousands of actions. I'll just say, well, actually you just have 600 between which, which you can choose because all others are not good for this particular case. Now, obviously that requires handcrafting, but it still will, will produce a better system than if you handcrafted everything, because for many things, you don't actually know what's better. So, if I might add something which performs great, even better in the next iteration about the limited scope, and uh, I would like to learn about that scope which I'm not aware of. Can, uh, is there something which I could just use for that? So yeah, so, uh, so, that, uh, so in order to do that, you can do that for reinforcement learning, and the key is the exploration. So I haven't talked about it at all. We mentioned it just through curiosity, and so uh, the reinforcement learning is, is based on two things, exploring the knowledge, which is exploitation, and ex uh, exploring new knowledge, which is exploration, so trying out new things. Uh, and because the space is so large, it has to, to sufficiently explore it to find new solutions. So it might come up with things that you haven't envisaged before. So for, for, for that, you can, you can also deploy it. No, I mean, you need to have a setting where you have interactions. So whether that's system and the um, in, uh, real user or the system and the simulated user, reinforcement learning hinges on interaction. There are ways where you can um, start, if you have a start set of dialogues, you can use this to seed it in some way. Uh, but ideally, you need some kind of interactive setting in order to, to start exploring. Because if you just have a static database, you're effectively what, you, what you're doing is supervised learning, not reinforcement learning. Uh, yeah? Simple question. Um, would you mind um, repeating the question into the microphone? Oh, okay. <laughs> that requires me understanding the questions. <laughs> yes? Is it feasible? Like, like, if I understand correctly, you're doing this uh, reinforcement learning in the real world. So you have to do it in the real world. You don't have a simulation, right? Uh, so the question was whether I'm doing this in the real world or whether I have simulation. I have both. So I'm... I'm um, my primary source of the well, first thing I evaluate the system on is a simulated user. And then if it works, if it's showing results, then I uh, evaluate it in interaction with real users. Well, real users in, in research terms are people who you pay to, to talk to your system, which is not quite the same as real users that you have. But the idea is that you can learn in real time from a, a, a real feedback that you get from, from the environment. So, and, and then also you can learn from, from databases of dialogues that you've collected before, which is this multi was dialogue. So we, we really cover a spectrum of different ways of, that we explore data. Did you have a follow-up question on that? I mean, what is this replay uh, slide that, mm -hmm. that covers that? Because I don't understand how to read something and make ah, it you simply, okay, so you say you are building your reinforcement learning algorithm in interaction with a user, either simulated or real. You, after the, the first interaction, in your database now you have a recording of one dialogue. And then after the second, you have a second and so on. And this database of dialogues that you recorded is growing. If you are doing vanilla reinforcement learning, you, on, you only use these dialogues once at the moment when you generate them. But the key of, re, uh, of uh, um, experience replay is to, is, is to reuse this data. So you go back to this data set and you offline repeat this dialogue. 
But the key is now, it's, it's basically, I don't know, like uh, if you're learning to, to, to do a, uh, to, I don't know, to uh, learning a poem, you sort of repeat all the time. So here you're repeating it, but you're not repeating the same, you're not, you know now that some actions in this, um, in this dialogue were not good, but some may be good. So you are putting important sampling on ones which are good and reducing the ones which are not good to improve your knowledge. So that is how it works. Yes? Can you come back to the slide to the 2D plot? To what, sorry? The 2D plot is a success type. Ah, yes. Mm -hmm. yeah. uh, you are this one. Yeah. You are doing the success type on the action space. Um, no, uh, so in reinforcement learning, the, we don't know what's, what is the true action that we should take, and we never know that. So the, sorry, the question was whether the success rate means the accuracy of actions or whether it means something else. Yeah, for me it's accuracy of actions. Yeah, it's, it's not. It's basically, uh, in reinforcement learning, I don't care which actions I took, as long as the outcome is, is good. So there are so many ways you can lead conversation. As long as the, uh, the outcome is, is good, that is what, um, what I care about. So this success rate here just measures the outcome of this dialogue. Did we, uh, did we provide all the information that the user wanted? And was this information correct? Which particular actions we used to achieve this is not important. Because uh, if you, uh, otherwise this would be supervised learning. So in supervised learning you have your dialogue and now you're trying to imitate, to take exactly the same action like you took in your data set. And this is not what reinforcement learning is about. Okay. Can you just explain why when there is more action, it's more difficult to train? Because you, you have a huge space of possibilities. Yeah, and you need to explore. Action are the input data, input data. Yeah. No, no, no. Action is what you are, what you potentially can say back to the, to the user. Yeah, but if it's not the output, I mean, you just, yeah, I don't know. If you know, sorry, if it's. You, you are adding complexity. If you have more action, you have more complexity. Yes, and then it takes more time to train the system. <laughs> yeah, sorry. How does it go from just the fact that it's more than a problem? What is the extra part? Sorry? Where, where does the, the extra... The extra... Information, aha, uh -huh, so that's here. Sorry, maybe you're sitting too far away, you can't see. Mm -hmm. So here. So here, the 15 actions is just very high level questions. Hello, buy, inform, request. Um, I don't know, offer and so on. So, but when I sort of decide I want to inform the user, I need to present some information. So will I present the information about food, or will I present the information about area, or will I present the information about something completely different? These are all different choices that I need to make. And if I, if I don't use learning, I'm going to make these decisions using some heuristics. I'm going to inform the most likely thing that I have in the belief state. But if I do learning, then I'm going to, then the system is really going to choose how it's going to populate these, the, 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 this action to become the full action. Now, you, you may think of, oh, that's really, um, a simple thing, you can write simple heuristics to do that, which is probably true for this simple task that, uh, that we are exploring here. But in a, if you think about real conversation, and if you want to model real conversation about a difficult topic where you have many, very many uh, possibilities to talk to the user, then you quickly see that you need algorithms to model that, and this is just one example algorithm that can indeed model this lar large number of choices. Oh, so this um, you mean into text? 
how you produce text. No, no, no. You so one action, like inform, can have many different outcomes. You can inform about food. You can inform about area. You can inform about different things. So this information, what you can inform about, is contained in your in your belief state that's derived from the ontology. So depending on how many different restaurants you have with how many different properties, there's so many things you can inform about. And they are all contained in this one summary action in form. We're going to wrap it up now. The official part, <laughs> because we're over time. And we're going to have to end because we have to wrap it up. Thank you. Thank you for a great talk. Thank you. And you can stay